You're watching the news on Bahrain International. I'm Hamid Shaban. Good evening. The Isa Cultural Center has launched a book entitled The Protocols and Ceremonies in the Era of Sheikh Hamid bin Isa bin Ali Al Khalifa by the historian Rashid Al Jassim. The book represents the first of its kind as it has been launched electronically as part of the country's commemorations of the centennial of its various institutions. The deputy chairman of the Board of Trustees and executive director of the center, Sheikh Dr. Khalid bin Khalifa Al Khalifa, opened a talk which attracted around 100 individuals who included intellectuals, specialists, and others from Bahrain and elsewhere. The deputy chairman said the book affirms the long historical traditions of Bahrain and the wisdom of the leadership under the Al Khalifa and he praised the efforts of the author which have amounted to this accomplishment. The author gave a presentation using various archival material that included photographs and primary source documents which he said can inform all of those who have an interest in the political history of the kingdom and its long-standing traditions into the modern era. The chief executive officer of the National Contact Center, Ahmed al Manai, affirmed that the efforts are ongoing to unify official discourse across all means of communication domestically and globally, which he said are intended to accurately reflect the developmental and civilizational contributions of the Kingdom of Bahrain under the leadership of His Majesty King Hamad bin Isa al Khalifa. He expressed thanks and appreciation for the keen national efforts in the country's various ministries, which he said have displayed a united spirit. He said that these bureaus represent an active partner in the ongoing processes, reform, modernization, and sustainability development under the leadership of His Majesty the King, with the support of His Royal Highness the Prime Minister, Prince Khalifa bin Salman Al Khalifa, and His Royal Highness the Crown Prince, Deputy Supreme Commander, and First Deputy Prime Minister, Prince Salman bin Hamad Al Khalifa. Al Manai added that the National Contact Center continues to support all efforts that shed light on the national efforts of Team Bahrain as it combats the pandemic across all national institutions by circulating over 160 media items through various media outlets domestically and globally. He also added that the center is supervising the process of inviting various media personnel to cover the efforts that are being made to combat the pandemic in all healthcare facilities. Finally, al Manai expressed appreciation for the cooperation of various state institutions, all of which have contributed to the achievements of 2019 and are contributing to plans for media campaigns. The Ministry of Health said today that the number of coronavirus COVID-19 cases reached 2,538 with 21 recoveries and 151 registered new cases. Out of the new cases, 82 are expatriate workers and 69 are contacts of active cases. The Ministry of Health urges everyone to adhere to the rules and affirmed the importance of following instructions, such as washing one's hands with soap on a regular basis, along with avoiding shaking hands and close contact. Moreover, covering the nose and the mouth when sneezing and avoiding public spaces when possible. The custodian of the two holy mosques, King Salman bin Abdulaziz Al Saud and U.S. President Donald Trump reaffirmed the strong ties between Riyadh and Washington in terms of their defense partnership. According to a statement from the White House, Trump discussed with King Salman the latest positive developments in defeating the coronavirus pandemic and re-energizing global economies. Both leaders also agreed on the importance of stability in global markets and reaffirmed the strong United States-Saudi defense partnership. President Trump and King Salman also discussed other critical regional and bilateral issues and their cooperation as leaders of the G7 and G20, respectively. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia reported 1,701 new coronavirus cases and 10 new deaths, bringing the total number of confirmed cases in the country to 35,432 and the virus-related death toll to 229. The Kingdom has witnessed 1,322 recoveries, bringing the number of total recovered cases in Saudi Arabia to 9,120. One of the deceased was a Saudi citizen, nine were of different nationalities, and all of them were between 25 and 58 years old. The deaths took place in Jeddah, Mecca, Medina, and Riyadh. Out of the newly detected cases, 13% are females and 87% are males. Out of the total detected cases in the kingdom, 26,856 are active cases and 141 are in critical condition. Now, Kuwait will enact a total curfew from 4 p.m. on Sunday through May the 30th to help curb the spread of the new coronavirus. Kuwait, on April the 20th, expanded a nationwide curfew to 16 hours a day from 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. and extended a suspension of work in the public sector, including government ministries, until May the 31st. On Friday, the Gulf state announced 641 new coronavirus cases and three deaths, bringing its total number of confirmed cases to 7,288 with 47 deaths. The number of cases in the six Gulf Arab states has risen steadily to almost almost 86,000 with 486 deaths despite containment measures including curfews, the grounding of passenger flights and the closure of most public venues. 
Now, Oman has reported 112 new coronavirus cases today, bringing the total to 3,224 confirmed cases in the country, according to the Ministry of Health. 52 of the new cases are Omanis and 60 are non-Omanis. The number of recoveries now stands at 1,068. The ministry has called upon all to adhere to the isolation procedures by staying in an isolated room with an affected, with an attached rather toilet and serving the isolated person from outside the room as instructed. The first two coronavirus cases in Oman were announced on February the 24th after two Omani women were infected during a trip to Iran. Oman has tested a large number of expatriate workers after coronavirus infections were detected among them. The country so far has conducted 50,000 tests. Egypt reported 495 cases of the new coronavirus, its highest daily increase to date as the number of deaths from COVID-19 confirmed by the health ministry rose above 500. The total number of coronavirus cases confirmed by the ministry stands at 8,476, while the 21 new deaths announced on Friday bring total reported deaths to 503. On Thursday, Egypt extended a nationwide nighttime curfew until the end of the holy month of Ramadan to slow the spread of the virus. Egypt has relaxed some restrictions designed to curb the spread, slightly shortening a nighttime curfew. Officials signaled that the country could gradually start returning to normal in June, but it also said authorities are ready to reimpose curbs if infections increase. Iran warned today that coronavirus infections were rising in the southwest despite falls in other regions as it announced more than 1,500 new confirmed cases. The health ministry stopped publishing provincial figures for the coronavirus last month and has instead opted for a color-coded system of white for low-risk parts of the country, yellow for medium risk and red for high-risk areas. Latest reports have shown Khuzestan red along with a few other provinces including the capital Tehran and Qom where Iran reported its first cases in February. Early last week, Iran's official daily case load hit its lowest level since March the 10th, but it has since climbed again steadily. 1,529 new cases were confirmed in the past 24 hours, taking the overall total to 106,220. There were 48 new deaths, taking the overall toll to 6,589. The U.S. State Department demanded cooperation from the Iran-backed Houthi militias with the efforts of the international envoy that has been sent to Yemen and to allow international parties to repair the oil tanker which is being detained by the militia in the Red Sea. The State Department statement said that the Houthis bear full responsibility of any repercussions along with all human and environmental costs if any spill occurs from the tanker into the sea. Warnings have been increasing in frequency on the possibility of an impeding environmental disaster in light of the Houthis' detention of the oil tanker as well as their obstruction of the work on the international personnel from repairing it in order to prevent what might amount to one of the worst cases of spills in the world. The race to develop a vaccine that would end the coronavirus pandemic is accelerating as several firms move to clinical trials, but the World Health Organization has warned that it is unlikely there will be a vaccine before the end of 2021. The development and mass distribution of a vaccine is widely seen as the most likely way to bring the pandemic under control. Governments across the world have pumped money into vaccine research as pharmaceutical companies, startup businesses, universities and research institutes work night and day to develop a vaccine. Three of the U.S.'s biggest pharmaceutical companies, Inovio, Moderna and Pfizer have already started clinical trials. In the UK, researchers at Oxford University have said they are aiming to produce a vaccine by the fall. Even once a vaccine is found to be suitable, it will then need to be mass massively produced and massively distributed, a potentially lengthy process in itself. Meanwhile, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, has cleared a potential vaccine for the novel coronavirus to enter a phase two trial, according to Boston-based biotech firm Moderna, adding that the vaccine might be supply constrained for quite some time. In a statement, Moderna said the imminent phase two study starts is a crucial step forward as it continues to advance the clinical development of mRNA-1273, vaccine candidate against SARS-CoV-2. Moderna said it is now preparing a potentially or rather to potentially have its first BLA approved as soon as 2021. In related news, a triple drug combination of antiviral medicines helped relieve symptoms in patients with mild to moderate COVID-19 infections and swiftly reduced the amount of virus in their bodies, according to results of a small trial in Hong Kong. The trial, which involved 127 patients, compared those giving the combination drug made up of the HIV medicine Iponavir Retronavir, the hepatitis drug Revivirin, and the multiple sclerosis treatment Interferon Beta with a control group give just the HIV drug. 
The findings published in the Lancet Medical Journal showed that on average, people who got on the triple drug reached a point of no detectable virus five days earlier than those in the control group at seven days versus 12 days. China said today that it supports the establishment of a panel led by the World Health Organization to review the global response to the coronavirus pandemic. The decision by China came after facing global pressure to allow an international investigation. China's foreign ministry said the review should be conducted in an open, transparent and inclusive manner at an appropriate time after the pandemic is over under the leadership of WHO Chief Tedros Adhanom. The Chinese comments came as U.S. President Donald Trump repeated claims that the outbreak originated in a Wuhan laboratory. South Korea reported 18 new coronavirus cases today after bars and nightclubs were urged to close following a spate of infections. South Korea urged clubs to close for a month after new cases jumped above 10 for the first time in five days. A decline in new infections had prompted the government to ease social distancing guidelines and announce plans to reopen schools on Wednesday. Most of the new cases are linked to the Itaewon Leisure District of the capital Seoul, where a 29-year-old man visited three clubs before testing positive. The White House said that Vice President Mike Pence's press secretary has the coronavirus, making her the second person who works at the White House complex known to test positive for the virus this week. President Donald Trump, who publicly identified the affected Pence aide, said that he was not worried about the virus spreading in the White House. Nonetheless, officials said they were stepping up safety protocols for the complex. Pence spokeswoman Katie Miller, who tested positive, had been in recent contact with Pence, but not with the president. Well, I don't know much about it. Does anybody want to talk about it? It's, she's a wonderful young woman. Uh, Katie, she tested uh, very good for a long period of time, and then all of a sudden today she tested positive. Uh, she hasn't come into contact with me. She spent some time with uh, the Vice President. Uh, it's, uh, I believe, the press person, right? You'd say press person. Uh, so uh, she tested positive out of the blue. This is why the whole concept of tests aren't necessarily great. The tests are perfect, but something can happen between a test where it's good and then something happens and all of a sudden she was tested very recently and tested negative. And then today, I guess, for some reason, she tested positive. So Mike knows about it and Mike has uh, done what he has to do. I think he is uh, on an airplane going to some faraway place, uh, but uh, you'll be able to ask him later on. But they've taken all of the necessary precautions. Sydney Harbour in Australia is home to the second most endangered seahorse species in the world, the white seahorse. It's a delicate species whose habitat is under threat from boating and other human activities. But now a breeding program and custom-built seahorse hotels from part of the project to boost their numbers in the wild. The white seahorse is listed as endangered by the IUCN Red List. A new conservation project is aimed to boost the White House's seahorse population as well as restoring its natural habitat in Sydney Harbour. The project is a collaboration between Sea Life Sydney Aquarium, NSW Department of Primary Industries Fisheries and the University of Technology Sydney. 95 seahorses that were bred in captivity are being released into Sydney Harbour at Clifton Gardens Beach, Mossman.